Welcome to Economics and Beyond. I'm Rob Johnson, president of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with Sarah Kinzior, a writer and author, and who has a podcast of her own called Gaslit Nation, which is very, very exciting. She's the author of two books. The first, The View from Flyover Country, and the second, which is very recent, Hiding in Plain Sight, The Invention of Donald Trump and the Erosion of America. Sarah, thanks for joining me. Oh, thank you for having me. Well, I uh, was very, very touched in listening to some of your podcasts, particularly in relation to the new book. And you and I share a similar experience. We both have uh, two young children. And uh, you were talking in the podcast about with all of us in such close proximity during this pandemic and lockdown, how frank can you be with your children? And I guess at the ages, mine are uh, eight and 11. And I guess yours are just a touch older than that. Uh, Nine and 12 or 13? Yeah, nine Uh, and 12. Nine and 12. So it is a delicate time. And particularly, I, I would say, because your own offering, your own vision is so hard hitting and at times frightening. But I'll tell you, uh, my one of my dearest friends who passed away last Christmas Day was the author William Grider. And he, in 2009, set up a, uh, a website of his own. And the first thing he said to me was, look at this. And the first post was about how he trusted in young people because they had fresh eyes. They could sense right and wrong, but they haven't been acclimated to what is feasible. Mm-hmm. And I would say that in my own t- searching, I, uh, I am often kind of jarred by young people. INET has this Young Scholars Initiative, which is uh, about 11,000 people uh, who are very, very vital and vibrant and see a need for the change in the world. But one night after my board met, two of my board members, both from California, John Paul and Drummond Pike, came over for dinner. And we were talking about climate change. And uh, Naomi Klein and her husband, Avi Lewis, are friends of the family. So my daughter, Sarah, had been quite exposed to the concerns, and and they went to the student strike. But Sarah became very quiet at dinner and was very quiet the next morning when I drove her to school. In the middle of what turned out to be her second period in fifth grade at 10 years old, that next morning... I got a, a text message with a photograph and she wrote this poem. What is everything by Sarah? What is everything? Is it all essence or is it all answers? Is there more? Why am I all covered up? Never seeing past, present or future. Is it all an illusion? Why is it all collapsing, destroyed? All those lives not knowing, will we ever know? When I heard that, or read that, excuse me, I was not in the mode of proud father. I was in the mode of the weight that that child's awareness is forcing her to bear. It's really a call to action for people like you and I. Mm-hmm. And I thought it was very, very daunting. And I've been, what I would say, uh, even more careful in how I share with with my two young children. And today, uh, in listening to your podcast again, it reminded me of that that critical moment. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a very difficult thing to kind of 
draw that line where, of course, you know, children are going to be aware of what's going on. You know, they're going to recognize uh, the, the danger that Trump poses simply by observing him. They're obviously aware we're in a pandemic. When you live in a city like Louis, St. Louis, like I do, you know, they're going to be aware of poverty, of racism, of all of these structural issues. Um, and so there's a combination where you you want them to have a sense of history. You want them to understand the root causes of the catastrophes that we're facing and also how people have faced them in the past, but without uh, completely demoralizing them, without leaving them with a, a feeling of futurelessness. Um, and mm-hmm. that feeling has kind of haunted younger generations. You know, that feeling has been with me um, for like the last 20 years, for basically all of my adult life. And it's not one that I want my kids to inherit, um, but I do want them to be aware. And, you know, one thing that I have noticed is kind of what you pointed to, that there's a refreshing kind of candor, a willingness to address um, the severity of the crisis head on, to just simply identify what's happening right before their eyes, which I think adults lack, um, especially adults that have long worked in institutions that want to protect institutions or reputations or prestigious venues. You know, kids don't care. Um, They tend to have a much more direct sense of right and wrong, and they tend to see through a con artist often um, quite quicker than adults. And so, yeah, I I do have hope for this generation in that sense, but I think that what they're facing down, you know, this combination of climate change, of incredible corruption, of the erosion of freedom um, in our country, it is an unprecedented mix of challenges. And so it's it's our uh, obligation as adults to protect them and educate them. But um, you know, that's what defines a lot of my life. Like, I feel like I'm not really fighting for people my age anymore. I'm trying to uh, illuminate the conditions we're in so that they can be changed so that a better future can be there for, by the time my own kids um, grow up. And so it's not so much as, you know, how do I uh, relay this information to them now because they're quite aware, but how do I work uh, to try to, you know, change these broken institutions, this broken uh, country for the future. Do you, do you see the pandemic, which is really unmasked a whole lot of things as an ally in, in your pursuit? Does it, uh, how would I say, weaken those who were strident about some false conscious conventional wisdom? Or is the fear uh, of this chaotic, disorienting time, make people want to lurk back to the familiar rather than forward to a new vision. How, how mean, do you see that balance? There's nothing good about the pandemic. I mean, I see the pandemic as something bringing mass death and also uh, an administration that wants to normalize mass death, uh, mass death that wants to uh, basically strip away the intrinsic horror of it that seeks to devalue human life. Um, You know, we've seen this from the moment it emerged when the Trump administration first denied it existed, then they wouldn't provide adequate medical equipment. We haven't seen uh, the traditional rituals of mourning in place. The flag doesn't go to half staff. Um, You know, there's all sorts of things about this that I find alarming because they're in line with the dehumanization that often accompanies um, an autocratic regime, which is, I think, you know, what they are trying to build. I think the pandemic, it does highlight uh, inequalities and suffering and a lack of access to resources uh, from different populations that was already there and that was, of course, underplayed by the press and not adequately addressed by Congress. You know, we see a disproportionate death toll among Black Americans, among Native Americans, among impoverished Americans. And we're also seeing scapegoating um, where both the administration and just various figures in the media and ordinary citizens are viewing other populations as diseased uh, because of their ethnic background uh, being one where where folks have been more likely to get it or just because they're, for example, Chinese American and there's been this weaponization um, of the coronavirus against people from China um, or just simply of Asian descent. And so, I mean, you know, I I feel like I'm living in a horror movie. I've predicted a lot of the things that came to pass in the Trump administration because they're basically following the dictator's playbook. 
you know, you see things like the purging of agencies, the packing of courts, uh, the use of propaganda, they're all fairly standard. I did not see um, a pandemic coming, but the minute it came, it's like no autocrat wastes a crisis. They always can bend it um, to serve their needs, whether those needs are financial or the consolidation of power. And so I do think um, it's working to that effect. And it's also to some extent mitigated mass protests and other, you know, uh, organizational activities where people get together face to face to try to solve a social or political problem. Um, there, of course, were there were mass protests last night um, in Minnesota. And so, you know, that I, I think that coronavirus is is not going to completely stop this, but I you know I worry about their health. Um, you know I worry about the health of anybody that's uh, out in the world trying to navigate a very uh, unpredictable, uh, mysterious virus like that we don't fully understand the effects of it. We don't fully understand how it spreads or what it does over the long term. Uh, you you brace many things in in this conversation already. I. I'm very concerned what I might call about the quality of representation in the United States and for that matter in other countries. We've had a, uh, a money politics that I, I often refer to as commodifying social design and, and narrower and narrower representation. Well, in the context of this pandemic, with an election on the horizon, I am concerned about the process of allowing an election to actually take place and to people to not go vote at all, or, or not just vote who they uh, prefer. I, there's a lot of work. Reverend William Barber works very closely uh, with people I know uh, on stopping voter suppression, but it feels like with the pandemic, the scale of this, uh, what I'll call refraction or, or anesthetizing democratic reaction could, could further what I'll call deeply damage people's trust in the United States of America. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, we've handled this crisis abysmally. You know, the United States, the United Kingdom, Brazil, Russia, um, you see the same tendencies in the leadership of all of these nations. These are either autocracies or aspiring autocracies that have administrations uh, seeking to personally profit off of the crisis and that have, uh, you know, no concern for how it's affecting average citizens um, of any of these countries or about that being known. And you see flagrant violations from people in government, whether it's uh, Jared Kushner here or Dominic Cummings um, in the UK and so forth. Uh, I am worried about the election because I never thought that this was going to be a free and fair election. Like when Trump got in in 2016, uh, I immediately thought well, it's going to be very difficult to get him out because he's going to abuse executive power to try to rig every apparatus of accountability in his favor. And he's backed by a political party that's completely acquiescent, that's complicit, that is in fact the mastermind behind this. You know, it's not Trump. It's it's these people like McConnell that know how to navigate a bureaucracy. It's his backers um, abroad, you know, these various oligarchs and mafiosos and so forth. And so, of course, he doesn't want to leave power. Um, because if he if Trump leaves office, then he loses his money, uh, his political power, and his immunity from prosecution. So he's going to do everything he can uh, to remain there. And it's not for the good of American citizens. And that can mean using the same tactics uh, that they used in 2016, which is a mixture of domestic voter suppression, foreign interference, uh, insecure machines. Um, but then with coronavirus, we have to reconsider the way that we vote and making sure that people are safe. And I've been saying since March that they need to switch um, to vote by mail in all states. You know, this has already worked very well for states like Oregon for a long time. And Trump, of course, mm -hmm. is trying to claim that this is, you know, a rampant way of uh, ensuring voter fraud, but that that's a complete lie. They see this as, as threatening. Um, that's also why they want to shut down the Postal Service. And I, I've been frustrated by the uncertainty that we have now where so many people just don't know, well, how am I going to vote? Like, how do I register to vote? Where am I going to go? How do I know that my vote uh, will be counted, that this will be um, a transparent election? And 
the problem is the more questions um, that everybody has about how this process works, the more that uncertainty is going to be exploited by Trump and by the Republican Party, because they'll come out like if they lose and say, oh, well, this was illegitimate. People couldn't vote because of coronavirus, et cetera, et cetera, utterly ignoring that they were the ones who, who tried to prevent people by vote from voting by uh, putting forth a simple system of vote by mail. So it, it raises a lot of questions. Um, but at the heart, it's just abuse of power. It's the fact that they have no desire uh, to serve the American people or to have a government that was chosen uh, by the American people. Uh, we're just, you know, extras in this play uh, that revolves around Trump and the criminals in, its, in his midst. Yeah, we uh, at INET uh, today published a piece by a gentleman named Philip Elvelda, which is a very, very uh, detailed quantitative study of the Wisconsin in-person primary vote on April 7th and the rise in cases and deaths that followed that. It strongly suggests that, uh, how would I say, that we should not have in-person voting. It does not uh, have any, it doesn't say anything about, well, I said I, it, in relative terms, yeah, you want to have by mail voting. But I'm, I'm a bit afraid that this kind of evidence, this is part of why Philip wanted to raise it up the flagpole now, will be used to postpone or cancel or whatever elections in the name of public health, mm -hmm. but not in the name of democratic health. Yeah, I think they're absolutely going to try to do that. We've already seen um, Jared Kushner basically discussing the election in that way, being like, you know, maybe we'll have it, maybe we won't, and using public health as the pretext. And it's a very difficult thing because there is a genuine public health crisis. You know, usually when the Trump administration tries to pass some sort of repressive policy, they invent a crisis. They say that there is a migrant horde, you know, clamoring at the border of Mexico. So we have to have a national emergency declared. Whereas that's not actually happening in reality. You know, they invent prior massacres. They invented the Bowling Green massacre. They, you know, they deal in alternative facts. But this is an actual public health crisis. One, of course, that they at first tried to deny existed. But yes, I, I think that they may use it um, to try to postpone the election. And I think that, I mean, ideally, it would be the Democrats and the Republicans and, you know, independents or anyone else coming together to make sure that the, um, you know, integrity integrity of the election system remains intact. Uh, I do think the onus falls on the Democrats for obvious reasons. You know, the reason being the Republicans don't care about election integrity other than violating it. They need to be uh, very proactive. It, the worst thing would be if they suddenly in October or September are greeted with um, members of the Trump administration saying, hey, you know, we're just looking out for the public. We think it's too risky to vote. We're going to have to postpone the election and then it would be postponed again and again again until there, you know, there is no uh, election. They need to assume that they're going to do something like that and get a system in place now, you know, one that is proactive and not reactive. And, you know, I think voting by mail is, is the safest way to go, but they need to make sure that that is, in fact, uh, a system that can't be tampered with. They should be dealing with experts. And if there is going to be in-person voting, since, you know, often these matters are, um, you know, decided by the states, that I think they need to be more creative. They need to maybe have it be more than one day or stagger out the times, you know, or limit um, the number of people that could be in a, a place in a given time or, you know, add more polling locations to spread them out or what have you. But the worst thing, though, like, as I said, is for this to be decided months from now in a move that looks um, insincere or, uh, you know, reactive to the Republicans instead of sincerely advocating uh, for the, you know, the guaranteed right to vote of all Americans. Well, I, let, let me ask you a question. I, I, I think your characterization of the Republicans is right, but both sides running for office, Democrat, Republican, incumbents and challengers, need to raise an awful lot of money mm -hmm. in light of having to pay commercial rates for media exposure, create activist teams, and, and various other costs. We don't have public financing of elections. And so that 
healthy democratic thrusts that you describe of the Democrats holding the Republicans' feet to the flames, is not one side effect of that, that they'll just chase the donors over uh, to Trump's side? Yeah, I mean, they do chase the donors. I think that's one of the greatest weaknesses and flaws of the Democratic Party is that they are, in fact, beholden to the donors. And there's this tension um, between, you know, older members of Congress who are particularly beholden uh, to these donors and this apparatus and, you know, others who want to inform it, uh, uh, reform it. I mean, and honestly, it doesn't completely break down um, along age lines. But I think, you know, younger people tend to have less wealth or at a disadvantage, you know, if some somebody in their 30s or 40s wants to run for office, it means they're going to have to make uh, enormous moral compromises to even get in the game. They're going to have to you know, accept financial help from people they may despise and then be beholden to them. And I think that that hurts uh, the range of people who might want to participate um, in government and be part of government. And so it, it's a deeply flawed, I mean, that doesn't even, it's a deeply corrupt system. And I think one of the things that needs to be done to just reform this entire disaster is repealing Citizens United, is getting dark money out of politics. You know, I live in Missouri, which has more dark money um, than any other state in the country. We were earlier to it. The problem emerged well before uh, Citizens United. And we don't have a representative government at all. Even when the voters, um, you know, vote for various propositions, like for um, raising the minimum wage or for something we had called Clean Missouri, which was supposed to get rid of Jerry gerrymandering um, and, you know, dark money through in, in campaigns and things like that, then the Republican legislature will just vote it down. They override the people's will flagrantly because they know that they're untouchable. And I think we're seeing a system like that now uh, at a national level. And it's, it's very difficult to combat. And I think that um, the Democrats not tackling this head on and not tackling a lot of our problems head on, whether they're ones particular to the Trump administration and its cr criminality or or ones that predate it um, by decades that were just never fully uh, rectified or addressed. We see that now. I mean, I do think we have weak leadership and it's unfortunate. It's the worst time uh, in American history to have leadership that is so timid and so seemingly afraid of, you know, rocking a boat that's already sinking. <laughs> that's, that's a great line. I was in uh, Detroit in 2016. Uh, on election day and a friend of mine uh, invited me to a, a party <clears throat> election night, seven people that I'd gone to high school with. But before I went to the party, I went and saw a gentleman, his name was Ulysses, who used to be a security guard in the medical office building where my father worked. And when I saw Ulysses, I said, well, what's going on with the election here, and it's, it was a rainy day in Detroit, but I said, what's going on? He said, oh, Mr. Johnson, it's like you went to a restaurant where there's nothing on the menu anyone wants to eat. People are just going to go to work and stay home. They're not going to come out, not at all. Mm -hmm. And that proved to be quite a prescient statement. Detroit has a population that's just under 800,000 people. That's not voter, registered voters, that's population. Turnout relative to 2012 was down 112,000. And despite that, the city of Detroit, of the 100 largest cities in America, had the lowest percentage vote for Donald Trump, 2.9% voted for Trump. So if they'd had the turnout, if the Democrats had been more inspiring, it would have been, uh, how do I say, a, a different result with regard to those electoral votes in that particular state. And I think there may be analogies elsewhere. But the interesting thing to me was among white, suburban, affluent people, all these people I went to the party with had a JD or an MBA or an MD or a CPA, all advanced degrees. And of the seven people I was with, six voted for Trump. Mm -hmm. And I said, what do you guys think you're getting? They knew I, that I hadn't. <laughs> and, and they said, well, Rob, you went and left and went to the East Coast and you and your family prospered. We're here. Our children are here. And whether it's welfare reform or criminal justice reform or privatization of prisons or NAFTA, 
the Democratic Party has not served us. And on the day after Trump uh, was nominated at his convention, he came to the Detroit Economics Club and he scolded top management in the auto industry for not preserving jobs. And, you know, his kind of bumper sticker was the system is rigged. Mm -hmm. And that diagnosis rang true with an awful lot of people. I think you and I would agree with that. Oh, yeah. This but is... his prescription, once he was in office, was in contradiction to the diagnosis. He exacerbates the problems. But I do think the Democrats contributed to those problems that allowed him to become inspiring for people who traditionally would not vote for that man. Oh, I, I think that's true. And, you know, Trump is good at that. He's good at honing in on human pain and exploiting it for his own advantage. He's good at recognizing uh, weaknesses and flaws. And he did that throughout the campaign. And it very much is regional. You know, when I would go somewhere like from St. Louis, when I would go to DC or New York or something, I felt like Katniss in the Hunger Games, like coming out from District 12 to see the Capitol. I mean, it was a, a completely different world uh, after the 2008 recession. And across the board, it doesn't matter what your uh, you know political persuasion is, people were suffering, people were losing opportunities, uh, people were losing their sense of the future. You know, there's this sense that, uh, you know, the good jobs, the mechanisms of survival were being hoarded uh, by a, a small elite, you know, mostly conglomerated in wealthy cities on the coast, and that absolutely no one really cared what happened to us here unless there was some kind of disaster that they could exploit, you know, for ratings or uh, whatnot, a tornado, a riot, um, or if there was an election, and then they would suddenly show up in Iowa and in neighboring states uh, clamoring for our votes. But there is a, a sense of um, dehumanization, and, you know, the those who voted for Trump from here, I mean, I think it's a variety of people. Uh, it's not a monolith. Some of them were intensely attracted to him because he's a bigot, because he's a xenophobe, he's a racist. Um, and he, you know, doesn't deny that. He stokes that kind of sentiment on purpose. There were others uh, who I think were not paying as much attention to the election. They were generally kind of disgusted with the whole thing. You know, they just kind of like the guy, uh, you know, you were talking to, um, where they just kind of looked at both of them. Them, at Hillary and at Trump and said, like, I don't even want to be part of this. And I've met people who, who did ultimately vote for Trump because they thought that he would have some kind of, um, you know, strong man approach to the economy that would emphasize uh, the Midwest, that would emphasize the industrial Midwest, and that would at least recognize that our conditions hadn't improved. Because one of the things um, that was hard to deal with during the Obama years were the, the speeches, honestly, from Obama, you know, where he would describe America and how we had gotten past our, you know, terrible financial crisis and we were, you know, blooming and flourishing yet again. And I would listen to that and think, man, like, I want to listen to, I want to live in that country. Like, I want to live in that America that he's describing that bears no resemblance to the reality of me or anyone I know. And this isn't all on Obama. I mean, he was handed financial collapse in two wars uh, by the Bush administration. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, during his first term, uh, he, he did a lot to keep it from getting worse than it actually was. And he did make some moves to fix it. And he was, of course, uh, blocked by the Republicans uh, throughout his entire presidency uh, whenever he tried to do anything. Yeah. But I think the lack of recognition, especially from someone who projected such empathy, generally speaking, as Obama did, it was selective empathy and it wasn't hitting here. When we would hear about how rosy things are, people would internalize that as I, you know, he must think I'm a failure or those, those people must think that we're all failures out here. And Trump honed in on that resentment and on that hurt uh, and exploited it like a vulture. And it did contribute uh, to his win. Yeah, I think that plus the fact that Brock was a black man made a whole lot of people, uh, which am I might call vulnerable to reacting to the hostility, even though Hillary Clinton obviously is Caucasian, uh, it, it sort of just set a stage. I think it made it much harder for Barack Obama to, to lead and to govern in some respects, uh, especially as that, as you said, the kind of what I'll call the seduce and abandon of speaking hopeful, acting like everything was going well when lots of people were suffering. That contradiction uh, 
what you might call fed the diseases of despair. But I, I think, uh, I, 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 let's let's talk a little bit. You're you live in St. Louis. I'm from Detroit. Racism, otherness, which is not just related to race, but gender and other things, has been almost the seed corn of how Trump holds his coalition together. You have a man who said the system was rigged. He mowed down 15 Republicans before he beat Hillary Clinton. And then he can't really appeal to broad-based economic prosperity. So resorting to what people call identity politics, demonizing, polarizing. I remember Charlottesville is a horrific episode. Like I said, you're you're from St. Louis. I'm from Detroit. When economies hollow out or become desperate, there's very fundamental research that says as economic insecurity goes up, racial animosity goes up in lockstep. Mm -hmm. People are displaced from focusing on the economic structural conditions and they start blaming others. And in, the reason I raise this now is when the black man is the president, they, I think many people somehow mistakenly felt like, well, Obama will take care of the black people or take care of the gay people or the movement because that's how he gets their votes. But he's left us hanging out to dry. He yeah. left us to despair. Yeah, I and think that that, oh, sorry, gone. I was just going to say that this mixture between identity politics and economic despair is a very toxic cocktail. Yeah, absolutely. And it's one that you see any aspiring dictator try to exploit. You know, you see the same things with Milosevic or Hitler or anybody who finds their minority scapegoat and then they pin the problems of the world on them. And, you know, they use that. And I think um, this is especially effective on, you know, older white people, especially white men, uh, baby boomers, um, you know, who had experienced uh, easier times uh, to some degree. But also, I think consciously or subconsciously fell in a position of privilege. And what Trump was doing was encouraging them to embrace that, encouraging them to think of themselves as superior and to think of themselves as, you know, having been robbed, uh, you know, having been uh, taken advantage of and had their, you know, rights or opportunities stripped away. And the thing is, is, you know, they were, but so were black folks of that generation. So was anybody uh, in America, not any tiny group of elites after the 2008 collapse. People really did lose their jobs, their their ability to pay their bills, uh, their benefits, um, their sense of, you know, hope and dream for the future. They really did lose that. But it was just white people, pretty much, um, that were going to vote for Trump. And that's because he made it acceptable for them to embrace, uh, you know, this toxic form of white identity to weaponize it and to kind of publicly revel in it. And I think uh, the more the media encouraged this, the more they treated it like entertainment or a joke or even bought into many aspects of uh, the white supremacy that he was peddling, you know, because the media is a, uh, you know, racist business um, of its own, the worse that it got. And, you know, the bottom line is that no one has been looked out for. No one's life, uh, with the exception of Trump and his crime cohort, has materially improved uh, since he came into office. And in terms of civil rights, um, it, it's been a you know a terrible time. It's been a time of rising hate crimes, of courts being rigged, um, you know, in favor of those who seek to discriminate against others, of voting rights and other rights being attacked. And um, it, it is it is very frustrating. And uh, but I think part of this is the refusal earlier uh, to address a lot of the pain and suffering Americans were experiencing head on. I think that the Obama administration was unwilling to do that because they saw it as an admission of failure, like as if they were saying, we have failed you. Whereas in reality, you know, the, the problem was very complex. It was structural. It predated the Obama administration um, and even the Bush administration. A lot of this is an extension of the Reagan era um, and the kind of fruition of those policies coming to pass. Uh, but they still, I, I think that an admission of it goes a long way. And I think Hillary Clinton realized that during the course of her campaign, um, where she suddenly was uh, embracing 
advertising policies more along the line of Bernie Sanders, um, policies that are labeled progressive or even radical, but are really more similar uh, to New Deal policies and to what a lot of these baby boomers and whatnot actually grew up with and experienced um, in their own life. And that, you know, I had a small taste of that kind of America as a kid, but I certainly haven't experienced it um, as an adult on my own. Yeah. One of the uh, scholars that work very closely with, uh, with INET is named Peter Temin. He's a professor emeritus at MIT, and I, I was an undergraduate student there. And he wrote a book a couple of years, I guess in 2016, seven, probably 2017 released, called The Vanishing Middle Class. And the book has a basic premise that as time has gone on and with globalization and technology, the value in the economy in the financial sense is be increasingly created by knowledge intensive services. And that requires a certain kind of pathway through education to assimilate those skills and, and to, uh, how would I say, become credentialized or accepted as able to work in that sector. But what Peter identified was that the poison of racism and the way in which public school systems are structured and isolated or cordoned off and segregated led to a system where the rungs in that ladder of progress were not there. And what he found most disheartening in studying this in deep dive in data and, and so forth was that uh, I think the way he put it is about 30% of the population is in high value added services. About 70% is in the low margin services and not being well paid, kind of gig economy work. But only about nine percentage points of that 70 were African Americans. But so many of the Caucasians voted against repairing the public schools in order to, what you might call, separate themselves from those others, that the entire system was disintegrating. And that the vanishing middle class without the rungs in the ladder for black, white, Hispanic, Asian, unless you were wealthy and privileged at the, at the starting line, led to a, the deterioration of our country and of our political system. And I don't think, I don't think that diagnosis, it's tragic, it's a social construct, it's not essential or necessary, but it feels like it's where we are. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, it's true, and it's gotten much worse um, over the last couple decades. And I think that credentialism uh, is part of that, you know, jobs that once required just a high school degree now require a BA, jobs that required a BA now require an MA or, you know, even a PhD or a degree above that. And that puts people either in an enormous amount of debt, or they just simply remove themselves from the process. They think, well, I can never afford this. I can never do this. This is a world that I can't enter. And that's hard enough on an individual, but I think it's hardest on parents when they're kind of looking at like, what possibilities does my child have in life and how can I get them there? And then they look at the average cost of like college tuition and they're like, my God, I mean, there's absolutely no way in hell. And I don't want to saddle my kid with a lifetime of debt. And then you also see uh, increasingly it's, you know, private school kids uh, having an advantage um, in college and public schools, you know, trying their best, I think, while they're being under funded to prepare kids um, for college, you know, even if it's like, even if the kid's not interested, because they just know that the absence of that degree will be such a black mark for them uh, if they go out into the job market. And so I think it's a, it's a system that's designed to reward, um, you know, elite or upper middle class at, at the least families uh, and their children who understand that the system even exists, you know, who feel this sort of um, desire to, you know, prepare 
prepare and groom for it, to stack their resumes from early childhood. And I think all of this might be going out the window now because of coronavirus. I mean, it was going to implode anyway, because what you really have is a generation of people my age, like in their 30s and 40s, who have a lot of debt from college, uh, who now have children. And they're thinking, well, Jesus, you know, I can't even pay off my own debt. How am I going to pay off my kids' debt? And college didn't really get me a great job, so is it really worth it? So I think that was always kind of coming. But I don't think uh, if we're going to have to do things virtually, if we're going to have virtual classrooms and virtual school, these lines between elite institutions and, um, you know, public regular institutions will blur because everyone will be trapped in their bedroom from the pandemic watching the same lecture and no one's going to want to shell out a lot of money. And I mean, I am worried. I'm worried about the system of higher education because I think there's value in learning. You know, there's value in study. There's value in reading and having teachers uh, that can guide you through it. I'm not against that, but I feel like it's become, you know, a very sleazy business, one that that exploits people's vulnerabilities, um, you know, and and that often can crush them into a lifetime of debt. So if it gets uh, radically reformed, I think that's a good thing. But um, I, I think at any rate, big change is, is coming our way. You know, we're in a holding pattern now because of the summer. But when when the fall starts and either colleges open or don't or public schools, uh, any schools open or don't, I think there's going to be a lot of reevaluation about what is this worth? What are we trying to accomplish? Who gets to participate? How do they get to participate? And so forth. Yeah, I think I think you're right on the money there, just right on the button, because I talk to lots of people, particularly uh, young people who are postdocs or assistant professors. They can see the stress uh, under which major universities are are now uh, encumbered. They see administrative leaders, deans and what have you, who are all making a million dollars a year resorting to well, outside marketing for funding, but but also adjunct professors and all kinds of ways not to fortify and secure the career of a, of a tenured professor, which makes those professors much more tentative, much more obedient to elites. And it, it reminds me, Wendy Brown at Berkeley, who's a brilliant scholar, had a book called Undoing the Demos, and it's, it's about what she called neoliberalism's stealth revolution. And as I listen to you and I'm, and I'm reading, I see what, what you might call the tyranny of meritocracy, to take the phrase from Michael Sandel's forthcoming book. I see the conformity. There's a wonderful book on the staleness of elite education called Excellent Sheep, Mm-hmm. Wendy's book talks about how the arts are being commodified. We've talked about how politics is being commodified, how education is being kind of shoved up against the wall, commodified, and, and credentialism is a, is a traded commodity. And you mentioned early on in this conversation how at times the press isn't working for the public good. They're working for their advertisers and the taboos that they abide by, all of which kind of contradicts the basis for health and faith and what I'll call wide open democratic discourse, which uh, we might call, are, are the underpinnings of a healthy, responsive society. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, careerism and conformity, they spring from this fear of being left out of what is a very, very narrow, very credentialized system uh, that gives you access to wealth and just access to baseline stability. I think that people, you know, once they get in this way in media and policy and in any kind of job, they are terrified of being booted out because once you lose your job in America, you know, you lose your health insurance, you lose your pathway forward, 
unemployed, the longer you're unemployed, the less likely it is that you're going to find uh, any kind of steady work in the future. And so people play that game. And I think that the system also just encourages people who are already willing to conform. You know, they don't like it if you're unconventional. They definitely don't like it if you challenge power. And even with a, uh, you know, proto autocratic, very unconventional, uh, you know, president and administration at the moment, there's still reluctance to challenge it overtly. There's reluctance to call a crime a crime and a lie a lie. And it's a similar thing to the kind of reluctance during uh, the Obama administration to admit uh, that people are suffering, that people are hurting, to just call things like you see them. Uh, people want to pretend that they're doing fine themselves because they want to believe that this institution, um, you know, the system that they've invested so much of their life and their money and their faith in, that it's real. Uh, but I think it's illusory. You know, it crumbles around us all the time, whether through overt corruption of our political system or something like the pandemic, which puts all of uh, these these flaws and these failures in plain sight, you know, where you can't deny that they exist. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it's it's been sad for me. Like I live in a place like St. Louis where, you know, in my mind, I'm surrounded by people who are interesting, who are creative, um, who have ideas that could be, you know, beneficial towards society and they're just absolutely locked out because uh, they didn't get a college degree or they didn't you know go to the right college and they certainly don't live in the right city um, and you know this often affects people disproportionately if you're not white uh, if you're not a man um, and especially if you don't have money and all of that leads to terrible conditions in terms of uh, who actually gets these influential powerful jobs you know that's why we have like Jared Kushner in the White House he kind of exemplifies this whole racket, you know, you buy your way into Harvard or your dad does and, you know, you marry the president's daughter and then you use your uh, power in office to just commit crimes and absolutely no one will hold you accountable because they're too afraid of the system of power that brought you to prominence in the first place. Yeah, well, I know uh, Jesse Isinger at uh, ProPublica uh, has just put out a paper on the implications of the, what you might call the nature of the bailouts, which both parties went along with, but which uh, Kushner and a team have had a lot of influence over. And what you're seeing is all of the big, strong private equity firms, Blackstone and Carlisle Group and all these, their prices are going up. Assets and existing wealth is being, uh, how do you say, fortified and protected. And at the same time, all kinds of small business is going out of business, is collapsing, and, all, and unemployment rate is skyrocketing. It, it's as if the bailout is to protect the donors in the existing power structure. And all, I think only if access to voting in election becomes more broad-based. Can people respond to this uh, dreadful experience? Yeah, I think and, that's... Sorry, Don. I'm, no, that's it. Go, 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 go. No, I mean, I think you're, you're absolutely right that they're using this to consolidate their power. And I think what the pandemic shows is that we have a class, it's like beyond the 1%. You know, we have an, an oligarchy class that can just coast above any kind of, uh, you know, catastrophic event because of the sheer hoarding of wealth that they've managed to accomplish. Like this isn't affecting them in any way. Uh, it's not reflected in the stock market. The stock market's not, a, not reflecting the economy. And there's no one looking out, um, you know, for small business owners either. Uh, you know, this isn't like a pro-capitalist uh, system. System. It's a pro oligarchy, pro pro plutocracy. One thing that worries me is that, in, you know, this appears to be an indicator that the election is not going to be free and fair. Because in a normal sort of circumstance, you would have the Republican Party being very concerned that small businesses or even, you know 
relatively small to medium corporations are being hit so hard by this pandemic that you have 100,000 people dead, that you have your own base potentially getting sick and dying and not having access uh, to medical care, not having access to the equipment needed. They're utterly unconcerned. Um, And they've been like that the whole time. They've had a number of extremely unpopular positions put forward and people have reacted with condemnation and they just, you know, roll along their merry way. So I'm worried um, about, you know, voter turnout and whatnot, but I'm also worried that the Republicans have acted like they've got this presidential election on lock, basically from the moment that Trump stepped into the White House. You know, the leverage of the public has diminished um, so dramatically over the, the past four years, but really over like the past 20 years, where you see massive protests against things, uh, no reaction from government, little coverage in media or skewed coverage. Uh, it's, it's a very frustrating thing. Well, Sarah, I was uh, inspired to ask you to, to come on this program with me when I read about your background, because you, you have a, a great vitality as a speaker and very, you know, heartfelt uh, expression of right and wrong. And I, I had learned that from your podcast, but I'd learned in the course of exploring that you actually did a PhD in anthropology mm-hmm. and you focused on, I believe it was autocracy and particularly Uzbekistan. Can you can you share with me what how did you get on that path? How did you get curious in that realm? Um, guys, a long story. Well, after I graduated college, I I worked in journalism. I worked at the New York Daily News, um, and I was there during 9-11. So I was reading a lot of articles about the war in Afghanistan, and I got very interested in the surrounding Central Asian countries, which I didn't really think um, had been adequately covered. Countries like Uzbekistan, um, you know, to make a long story quite short, uh, I went on to Indiana University and got an MA in Central Eurasian Studies so I could learn... um, Um, to speak Uzbek and Russian with the hope of doing journalism abroad and kind of filling in those gaps. While I was there, uh, I began working as a research assistant for an anthropologist. I got interested in anthropology because honestly, there's more opportunity to write about places like um, Uzbekistan, you know, in that field than there certainly are in a a regular uh, American newspaper. And this is, of course, media was already being gutted and these opportunities were vanishing anyway. Um, And so then, yeah, I applied to, uh, to a number schools. I got a full ride at Washington University in St. Louis, uh, moved here in 2006, finished my degree in 2012. And I focused on Uzbekistan. But what I ended up doing, because Westerners got basically banned from Uzbekistan right around the time that I was planning to go, because the Uzbek government had fired um, on protesters and killed about 800 people in what's known as the Andijan Massacre. And they didn't want anybody there writing about it. I, of course, went on to write about the massacre anyway, um, thus reaffirming that I would never be allowed in Uzbekistan. And then focusing on the diaspora that had been created by that massacre when so many people had to leave the country and they began, um, so many Uzbek people, and they began setting up blogs and all these ways of interaction and talking about politics that were never allowed in Uzbekistan. And so I was very interested in how the internet was being used by dissidents and how the internet was being being used by authoritarian regimes for surveillance and for control, and how all these facets of the internet that were at this time new, things like anonymous comments, how they could be exploited. And all of this proved very advantageous in understanding the 2016 election here, where I was seeing tactics used that were so reminiscent of what um, the Uzbek government or Russian government or Azerbaijani government would use against their own uh, citizens. You know, they often refer to uh, Steve Bannon as having pioneered the strategy of, you know, flooding the zone uh, with with uh, nonsense, or uh, there's another word they're using, uh, propaganda, conspiracies, and so forth. But this is a very old strategy. And in terms of the internet, uh, it really was pioneered much more effectively by dictatorships from the former Soviet Union. Yeah, I remember listening to the podcast they called The Big Steel. And uh, it was all about Russian kleptocracy and then these these techniques. Uh, there's a young scholar named Emma Briant, who's been a fellow and someone we've funded for research 
and was got very involved in the diagnosis of Cambridge Analytica, and it, it, it almost felt to me like science fiction. Oh, she was on learn. our show. She she came on oh, Gaslit yeah. Nation, and we interviewed her about it. Yeah, it was a it was a very yeah. horrifying interview, very illuminating. But I mean, the, yeah. what she's discovered uh, is appalling. So yeah. I was reminded of her as I listened to one of your podcasts because she had experienced uh, uh, what I'll call rather formidable threats to her life. Mm -hmm. And I remember you talking about similar kind of uh, uh, challenges to you that were presented to you. And uh, but but Emma, she's done some really great work for INET and uh, I'll, I'll send you some of the things that she did for us for just for your records. Oh, great. It, uh, so you, you studied this. It, it's almost like you started with Uzbekistan and all of a sudden you've got a window into the world. Yeah. And, that... it, and it, it's just amazing because the United States now has these founding documents and so forth, but nothing, whether it's the courts or the legislature, or the media, none of them act like, which you might call that romantic vision in all of our principles and founding documents. And this, you, I guess what I'm saying is, after you studied a bit, did you start to smell incipient autocracy at home? Well, yeah, I mean, I certainly saw parallels in terms of corruption, in terms of, uh, you know, I guess what we could call purchased meritocracy, where the sons and daughters of elites uh, were the only ones who could get certain opportunities. And, you know, one of the things that was most chilling about Uzbekistan is, of course, it's a democracy on paper. You know, all the rights that citizens are routinely denied, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, uh, a free market, uh, are all guaranteed to them, you know, through their constitution. And they're supposed to have a functional justice system. And it's all a lie. And, you know, some of the um, folks that I knew in Uzbekistan were doing what was considered a very uh, subversive kind of uh plot, which is basically trying to get Uzbek officials to follow the own their own laws, the laws of their own constitutions. There is a group of Uzbek lawyers who would represent clients and they would just be like, yes, in the constitution, it says that you cannot demand uh, bribes of people on the street. You know, they would say this to Uzbek policemen and so forth. And, you know, yeah, I was always aware, of course, you know, you can't not be growing up in America that our laws uh, were not always practiced on paper. And there is, you know, a long hundreds year struggle of trying to have uh, the ideals of the founding fathers that they themselves did not hold up in practice, to have those ideals actually enforced and have them include all citizens and not just a narrow few. Um, but my study of it did coincide with the U.S. kind of going off a cliff because of the Great Recession, uh, because of massive technological change and hyper-partisanship and, you know, all these, these sea changes that were going on. Um, and it coincided with me having children. And I think when you have kids, um, it does change your worldview because things that you were not directly engaging with, like the public school system or, you know, what the cost of child birth is or child care or any of that is nowadays, you might not know that. Um, but as soon as you are financially taking care of a dependent and you're trying to envision that person's future, uh, you become much more attuned to uh, inequalities and, um, you know, systemic rigging of the system around you. It's not just affecting you, it's affecting the person you love the most. And so all of that was kind of um, going on my mind at once. And the other thing is, you know, once you study um, an authoritarian state or once you go to one, you know, it, it'll haunt you. You will never want your own country to turn that way. And it's not like there's ever been a completely free democracy. Um, you know, every democracy is flawed, but there's a real difference, obviously, between a democracy and an autocracy. And I could see how America uh, could fall. And I could see us moving um, in that direction. And then with Trump, it was like a violent acceleration of, of what I feared would be coming. Uh, and I hoped that people would stop it. I hoped officials would at least take advantage of the fact that this is someone who's committed criminal acts and, you know, hold him accountable and prevent him from, um, you know, abusing executive power in the way he has. But they haven't. You know, they, they've caved every time. They've let him get away with it every time. Uh, and that's something that that worries me, too, because I do think we are heading uh, in the direction of Russia, in the direction of these other mafia states. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, last night, 
I, I don't have a biological brother, but my next door neighbor through my childhood now lives in Southern China. He works with power generation company and he's about to retire. And I said, well, what does it feel like with the pandemic and everything? And, and he, he said to me, uh, well, I'm so stoked about living life in a free country again. And then he's kind of dot, dot, dot. Is that what I'm coming back to? <laughs> 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 and uh, so I think, th I think these are, the, these are very daunting, very daunting challenges. I guess uh, as we come down the, to the, how do you say, the home stretch here in our conversation, if, if you were asked for, on behalf of your children and mine, what reforms to implement in the United States to put us back on track? What would what would be the top five on your list? Oh gosh, well climate change, you know, actions to to slow climate change and you know uh, yeah. fend off that kind of massive catastrophe as much as possible. Uh, dark money in politics, uh, corruption, and cr elite criminal impunity. The fact that people uh, with enough money and power and privilege can essentially do whatever they want and have decided to infiltrate our government. Those people all need to be brought to justice. You know, those people all need to be taken to task. And right now they're treated as untouchable and they're doing an enormous amount of damage. So I'd put that as a, as a foremost uh, priority. You know, I think we need something akin to like a truth and reconciliation uh, commission combined with like Nuremberg trials to really clean out um, the raw. And then, you know, on top of that, I think uh, reforms to education, to access to a quality education everywhere, to not have it built on your tax bracket. Um, you know, my kids go to public school in St. Louis uh, and, you know, I, I love their teachers and I think that, you know, they're getting a pretty good education, but it's always a struggle to just get basic resources, basic funding that, you know, a few zip codes over, they have no problem getting. And that inequality, uh, that starts young and it, it'll last, you know, for a long time, unless you're able to overcome obstacles that were not your fault. So I guess those would be like the big five. Okay. Well, I heard you say in a, one of your podcasts that a, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down from a Mary Poppins uh, song, and uh, that I appreciate your five-part spoonful of sugar to help <laughs> us uh, gain direction. One of my favorite books is called The Life of Poetry by a woman named Muriel Rukeyser. It was written in the 1950s, I believe, and uh, at the beginning, oh, 1949, and at the beginning of the book, she's talking about why sometimes in dangerous times, people are a little bit afraid of poetry because it stirs the imagination and they want to settle down. But she makes a declaration and she says, if we are free, we are free to choose a tradition. And we find in the past, as well as the present, our poets of outrage like Melville and our poets of possibility like Whitman. And I sense both of those dimensions with a more than a spoonful of courage characterize the path that you've chosen. I'm uh, fond of music and musical lyrics. And as I listened to you today, it reminded me of a Leonard Cohen song called Anthem, where I'll just go with the verse that was ringing in my mind. The birds they sing at the break of day, start again, I heard them say, don't dwell on what has passed away or what is yet to be. Yeah, the wars, they will be fought again. The holy dove, she will be caught again, bought and sold and bought again. The dove is never free. So ring the bells that still can ring. Forget a perfect offering. There's a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Sarah, you shed light on the things that matter for our recovering our balance, our integrity, and how would I say our path towards a prosperous future. And I think of that in terms of delivering to all of our children what we need to do to get to where we got to go. 
So I want to thank you for being with me. And I would like in a few months to call on you again and we can explore where things are, perhaps around election time from yeah, a slightly different fun. vantage point. That would be great. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you. And uh, how would I say? Uh, someday I got, I got to meet your children. I know, I know, <laughs> we'll have a play I, date, I, I, <laughs> a quarantine I, play I, date. Uh, yeah, we'll do that because I know, <laughs> I know for sure that your children are getting a great education because I got one today. Oh, well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks. Talk again soon. Bye-bye. Bye. And check out more from the Institute for New Economic Thinking at ineteconomics.org.